Welcome to Retirement Rescue Radio, a show specifically designed to help retirees and pre-retirees maximize their financial efficiency so you can live the retirement lifestyle you've always imagined. Your host is Nate Miller, investment advisor representative and author of the CPR Retirement Rescue Roadmap. Nate discusses thoughts and ideas from some of today's most knowledgeable professionals in the field of finance. He offers strategies along the way to help you make better financial decisions so you can maximize your retirement. This is Retirement Rescue Radio. Well, hey there, Retirement Rescue Radio listeners. I'm your host, Nate Miller, and we've got a great episode today. Uh, today, I will be speaking with Ashton Applewhite. Uh, Ashton is an author, a journalist, a speaker, and an activist who is on a mission to raise awareness and push back against ageism. She's the author of This Chair Rocks, A Manifesto Against Ageism, and her work was inspired by a project in which she interviewed older people in the workforce, learning about longevity and happiness, and uh, she discovered that most of her ideas about later in life were either way off base or just completely flat out wrong. And she became fascinated by why ageism is so prominent and uh, who benefits from it and what she could do to change people's perceptions and ideas around it. And before becoming an advocate against ageism, you may know Ashton for a strangely different reason. Uh, she wrote the best selling mass market book of 1983 called Truly Tasteless Jokes uh, and was the first ever author to have four books on the New New York Times bestseller list at the same time. So, you know, Ashton's going to bring to the table a little bit of a sense of a humor. And uh, she's been recognized as an expert on aging by the New York Times, by NPR, the New Yorker, and the American Society on Aging. She's also contributed to Harper's, The Guardian, and many more. In our conversation today, Ashton joins us to talk about why we're so unnecessarily afraid of getting older, what drives those fears, and how to make those fears a lot less fearsome and, and uh, a whole lot more that we're going to go into as well. She's also willing to uh, give away her book. Um, actually, if you go to, if you write a review for our podcast on iTunes or wherever it is that you get your, um, your podcasts and then copy and paste that into an email to ask Nate at Mil or excuse me, ask Nate at retirementrescuradio.com. We will go ahead and send a copy of that book to you. So just you'll paste a copy of the, the review and your address so we can send one of those copies to you. We'll send them out until they're gone. Uh, and then if you want uh, a book after that, then I guess you're just going to have to go to the, the website or to Amazon, which we have all those links in the show notes as well. And so with that, um, enjoy my interview with Ashton Applewhite. All right, Retirement Rescue Radio listeners, we've got a very special guest with us today. Ashton Applewhite is with us. Ashton, welcome. Thank you. Are you ready to help rescue some retirements? Uh, if they want rescuing. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thanks for coming on here. And uh, first, I got to say, uh, I guess, you know, uh, I'm going to say this tongue in cheek. Welcome, young lady. And that's going to make you go down a rabbit hole of, of stuff because I hear you don't like being called that. And I would like you to, uh, I guess, let our listeners know why. I don't. I mean, I didn't like being called young lady much when I was a young lady because I found it patronizing. And now as I approach my 70th birthday, I still find it patronizing. Mm -hmm. The only reason someone would call me a young lady is to... They, I mean, they, they intend it as a compliment, mm -hmm. but all it does is emphasize the fact that I am not young and suggest that I should wish to be young or mm -hmm. wouldn't it be nice if the world saw me as a young lady mm -hmm. and sort of the, you know, the fundamental backbone of ageism, which is discrimination and stereotyping on the basis of age, uh, it's any judgment on the basis of age and young people experience a lot of it also, but we live in a youth obsessed society. Older people experience the brunt of it. And the, the fundamental idea here is that old is bad and youth is good. So I don't want to accept that compliment because I reject that notion. I think every stage of life is, has its unique uh, you know, drawbacks and advantages. I wouldn't go to back to my youth for a million dollars. And I don't know anyone who would. So then that makes me I got to ask this question, then there's the old saying uh, that you hear every now and then of how 
50 is the new 40 or 70 is the new 50 or what, whatever age is the new younger age, just insert whatever age, right? How do you feel right. about that? Well, shocker, I don't like it. Yep. Uh, for one thing, uh, two points here. Being, you know, I am 70 or about to be 70 in a way that is not, you know, it's different from the way a generation ago or two generations ago, people were 70. Not that many people even lived to be 70. Mm -hmm. You know, people, you know, lives were very different. So, uh, so my 70 is, is a new way of being 70, but it is not the new 60 or the new 40 or the new 50. That way of thinking does just what I already described, which is mm -hmm. to suggest that younger would be better. The other reason I don't like that way of framing things is that possibly the most important thing I could convey, if I had to just hang on a single fact for your readers, mm -hmm. the longer we live, the more different from one another we become, right? Every newborn is unique, but 27-year-olds have much more in common developmentally, socially, um, you know, education-wise than 47-year-olds who are way more like each other than 67-year-olds and so on out. So any thinking that lumps people of a given age into a category and assigns us certain, you know, that says we're we're all alike in some way is problematic because it uh, leads to stereotyping. And, you know, with the same, if you say all people of a certain religion or people of a certain skin color, right? It, but all people look alike, that's or, <laughs> right. And, and so I can't possibly be 70 the way anyone else is 70. And there are many more ways of being 70 out in the world than there are ways of being seven or 17. Mm -hmm. I prefer I had, I had another um, interviewee on my podcast and I like what they said. They said, no, no, no. 70 is the new 70. Not the not the other way. It's 70 is the new 70. Like this is what 70 can look like. Exactly. Or and it is different from the way it was being 70, mm -hmm. you know, in my parents' generation or the generation before that. And there's, you know, lots about that is wonderful, but it's not because we're younger. Mm -hmm. It's because of, a whole, because you can only be the age you are. You cannot ever be any younger. You can be active, you can be healthy, you can be cranky, you can be sedentary. You, we're each going to do this in our own way, uh -huh. but we're, we, you know, it doesn't make us younger. So you hear all those people that are like, I, they're saying they work out to look younger or they're trying this new cream or whatever because it's supposed to make you look younger. What are your feelings on that? Well, we're back again, of course. If the goal is youth, um, we're in trouble. Fundamental mm -hmm. reason, it, it reinforces the idea that young is better. It's delusory because no matter what your skin looks like or your abs look like, you're going to wake up a day older. So if, you know, uh, we should work out to have a flatter stomach, we should work out to be fitter, we should work out to be healthier, to live longer, but aspire to health, not youth, mm -hmm. right? So think about, and in the sort of broader context, every time someone says, you know, I feel so old, or I feel so young, what we really mean is insert negative thing, I feel invisible, I feel mm -hmm. incompetent. I felt those things at 13, mm -hmm. worse than I do now. They're not actually a function of how old we are or how young we are. So reach for the, the actual reason you work out, I'm guessing, you know, is to feel fit and to feel like ready for what life has to offer. And I'm sure there are mornings where you feel like no matter how much martial arts you did, you're not ready for the world. <laughs> and that's not a function of how old you woke up that morning. That's a function of, you know, what's on your plate and your mood and a thousand other things that age has nothing to do with. Yeah, I do. I do martial arts because it's fun. The other working out I do, I tell my wife, look, I don't really work out for the health reasons. I just work out to look good. That's that's it. <laughs> exactly. Look good. But to look good does not necessarily mean looking young. Right. Exactly. That's that. That's the link that we have to break is the association of of youth with beauty, of youth with more value, because mm -hmm. it's discriminatory. And and the longer, you know, the, the and, it, and we pay a price for it lifelong. And the older you get, the harder it is to reconcile the way you feel, which mm -hmm. is often pretty terrific with the way society says you're supposed to feel, which is icky and self-loathing. Yep. And so uh, you've got a, a few books. I mean, we're basically here to talk about the one that you've 
written just a couple years ago called This Chair Rocks, a Manifesto Against Ageism. But you have written a few. You wrote a book in the 80s called Truly Tasteless Jokes. So I'm expecting to hear a few of those come out uh, as we're talking. I'm not, I mean, I'm I, 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 I'm not dying. I mean, I'm not going to talk about them. I'm, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not expurgated, but I have zero interest in talking about them or drawing attention to them. If you want to do so, feel <laughs> free, but I'm All not right. going there. Sounds good. Um, I want to talk about this, though. Uh, at one point, you did the opposite of what so many other people do. Um, so many women, especially, we'll talk about those guys do it too as well, though. But I, I, I don't because I don't have any hair. But we dye our hair as we get older. Um, I know my, my mother-in-law uh, does it quite a bit, but they're dyeing it to get rid of the gray. You actually dyed yours gray, basically. <laughs> talk about that. What, what led up to that and kind of what were some of the experiences of that? Yeah, well, I, um, I, a, a number of years ago, I was coming out of a movie theater in the afternoon. So in, in a weekday, so a lot of the people there were older because they were not at their jobs. And I was coming up an escalator and I looked down and I saw this sea of uh, older people and uh, hardly any gray heads except on the men. And I thought, you know, dyeing our hair just to cover the gray is one way in which we make ourselves invisible as older women. And when a group is invisible, so are the forces that it affect us, right? We, we erase ourselves in that way. So I put on my Facebook page, I said, how about the year of letting our hair go gray? We'll do it all together and we'll support each other and it'll be great. And I got a ton of blowback, which I completely deserved. No one, and I, I no longer make the mistake of telling anyone, let alone women, what they should do, how there's so many voices telling women in particular what we should look like, right? Mm -hmm. But someone said, you go first. Now, ironically, I there is some gray hair here. I'm going to count on you to tell the readers right. that it's true. We'll but I inherited my mother's no gray hair gene. But one woman put on Facebook, she said, you go first. And that seemed fair. So I mm -hmm. did go and get my whole head bleached white. And then for quite a few years, spent time and money putting white into it. I have to say two things happened during the pandemic. First of all, my social ex experiment got carried out by the pandemic because so many women were unable to get to the hairdresser because it wasn't safe. And a lot of them said, you know what? I'm sick of dyeing my hair. If, and if, let me be clear. If you want to dye your hair purple, if you want to dye your hair because you've always done it, if you want to dye your hair because you like dyeing your hair, no judgment at all. And I'm sure everyone thinks I dye my hair, which is mm -hmm. ironic, but there you have it. You know, it's just reinforcing, you know, in an ironic way, this whole idea of like what really matters about women is our appearance. You know, and I've had women say, look, if I didn't dye my hair, I'd lose my job and I have children to support. And I wish I could say, oh, don't be silly. You're overreacting. But it's probably true. So we all need to do what we got to do to hang on to our jobs and pay the rent. But when we do things like covering our hair just to cover the gray or leaving early accomplishments off our resumes or fudging our age in conversation, those behaviors aren't good for us because they're rooted in shame about something that shouldn't be shameful. Mm -hmm. And they give a pass to the discrimination that makes those behaviors useful. So I do see a lot more gray hair on my Zoom conversations from women who did go gray and men as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I hope there'll someday be, be a world where we do not judge people by the color of their hair any more than we do by the color of their skin or, you know, where they worship or who they sleep with. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting. So I've always been a little bit jealous of those guys that do go gray, obviously, because I have none up there anymore. Um, but I do have a little bit sprinkled in, in throughout here. So I've always looked at it as being distinguished to go gray. And I've just got to wait until it comes in through, you know, throughout the beard. Or maybe I'll go and, and bleach my <laughs> bleach my beard. Uh, I think it looks great, but there is a double standard around this mm -hmm. that aging, you know, sort of makes men more distinguished up to a certain point. Then you get to fall off a cliff with the ladies, yeah. um, whereas it devalues women. And that and there we're looking at the intersection of ageism and sexism, mm -hmm. which is why aging is different and harder for women. So we've got all these, now that you brought this up, let's go down that uh, route for a little bit. We've got 
ageism, we've got sexism, we've got racism. There's a lot of isms that are out there right now. Um, where do you think we are on the, I guess, the, the timeline of ageism compared to maybe racism or, or sexism? Yeah. Do you think we can get rid of it? So I'm, I know there was probably like three or four questions right there, but. Yeah, well, Dr. Robert Butler coined the term ageism in 1968 to in the, the thick of the civil rights movement, the second wave women's movement to piggyback on our awareness of racism and sexism and these growing social movements. It has taken a long time for the age liberation movement to catch up. I guarantee you that it is happening. And for evidence, uh, I want people to turn to a site called the Old School uh, Anti-Ageism Clearinghouse, oldschool.info. There's a whole campaigns section of campaigns, not about living forever or being healthy, but how to educate people about ageism and how to dismantle it. So a global movement is underway. Uh, and I am optimistic, not only because it is happening, but because I think all the work we have done, um, you know, progressive people around learning about these forms of bias, and we are all biased, we're all, you know, we all, we are all prejudiced, but we have learned a lot, I think, especially since, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, since the, you know, Me Too, it, just to pick two more recent things mm -hmm. about looking for bias in ourselves and thinking about how we can unlearn it and address it and build a more equitable world. So that, so sometimes I think of what I'm doing as hitching age to that sled, to that intersectional sled. And because the ground I think has been plowed, we know a lot more about what internalized bias is and how it works. It's not the same, ageism is not the same as sexism or racism, but the ways in which it creeps into our brains is similar and the things we know about how to address it are broadly applicable. So we're not starting from zero here. When I ask people what they think of, for example, as criteria for diversity, age is not always on the list. But when I say, what about age? Nobody says that's a dumb idea or mm -hmm. let me get back to you. You know, they smack their heads and go, well, duh, obviously. So I think the ground is plowed and that it's a much shorter leap to add age to this, you know, to, to all the movements for equity that are happening now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, great. So um, I need to circle back around to this because I did bring up your, your book, This Chair Rocks, the Manifesto Against Ageism. What initially even inspired you to write that book and, and basically fight ageism? Uh, well, it, it was, it, broadly speaking, uh, you know, I, I've been self-employed for a long time. A lot of people turn to become aware of ageism when they encounter it in the workplace. Mm -hmm. It is the first form of bias a lot of white men encounter. So that's a rude wake up call for them. And they have a really important role to play in this struggle. I was sort of, I hit my mid fifties and I realized I was incredibly apprehensive about growing older. I just, you know, I had never thought to question the dominant narrative of everything's going to fall apart, even though I was, you know, really enjoying the age I was, but my apprehension was making it much harder to do so. So I started interviewing older people, inter older people who were, as it happened, uh, people over 80 in the workforce and learning about longevity. And in a matter of months, if not weeks, and I wasn't digging for the obscure, you know, two articles that said something good about getting older. Uh, I learned fact after fact that showed me that my view of late life was so out of step with the reality all around me, not to mention all the older people literally all around me who were in the world in all kinds of interesting ways. Uh, I mean, an example, I thought the odds of ending up in some horrible nursing home were pretty good. And when I started this uh, project about 15 years ago, the percentage of Americans over 65 in nursing homes Want to take not not all senior living, but yeah. nursing homes. Want to take a guess? Uh, I, I mean, I know the the total number or the total percentage that will have some type of long term care incident happen sometime in their life after they hit sixty five. But the total percentage that are in nursing homes, I don't know that one. Uh, well, I I would have said twenty five or thirty percent. Mm -hmm. It at the time that time it was four percent. It's now down to two and a half percent, and it's comparably low in Canada and Western mm -hmm. Europe. Yes. So, the, you know, 
it, it, or, and I thought, well, of course, old people are sad and depressed because they're old and they're going to die soon. I mean, which is an incredibly ageist thing to say. It turns out if you Google, uh, I loved my mother-in-law was always super skeptical about this. She said, I don't believe it. Google U-curve of happiness or, or happiness U-curve. Study after study shows that people are happiest at the beginnings and the ends of our lives, that it is the midlife that is the toughest. And then, I mean, I was so skeptical. I was like, oh, they must have cornered two old people and given them a cookie and said, how are you doing? It's true everywhere in the world. It's true whether you're rich or not. It's true whether you're married or not. It is a function of the way aging itself affects the brain. So, you know, I'm a wonky, nerdy, you know, researcher type person, although I'm not an academic, but I, you know, I'm facing this like bigger and bigger pile of, of data. This is blue chip science. I, you know, I can't, it's floating at the top of the internet, check it out. And I just thought, so the catalyst for writing the book in answer to your question was like, why don't people know these things? You know, and the, the short answer to that is, is we live in a, in a highly consumerist, mm -hmm. cap, um, you know, very capitalism driven society. And if aging can be framed as a disease to be cured, quotes around the cured, mm -hmm. we can be persuaded to buy things to, you know, to fix it. And if aging can be framed as a problem, you know, then we can be persuaded to buy, you know, face creams that don't work or, or mind, mind, you know, brain games that are supposed to fend off dementia and only make us better at playing that particular game. But, you know, no one makes money off satisfaction and self-acceptance. No, they don't. Uh, and so why, what would you consider? I mean, this, I'm a retirement advisor, right? But the problem is that term retirement is can, can be defined in so many different ways and it's almost becoming obsolete yeah really it's like you know when i think of what i want to do as i get older i don't want to retire because retire has the connotation of you know well one when someone says i'm going to retire for the night they're going to go to sleep so there's like they're they're <laughs> quitting they're stopping um i i think more of refocus is really what i would be doing and I wouldn't be spending as much time in my business. My business would still be running, but I would like to refocus some of my efforts elsewhere rather than just retiring and playing golf all day. One, I, I'm horrible at golf, so I wouldn't do that anyway. Yeah, um, I, th I think you're, you're, that's true of a lot of people. We might want to work less hard, fewer mm -hmm. hours, have more control over what we do with our time. But you know, if you're lucky enough to have work that, that you enjoy, and that you're good at. Most people don't want to just, you know, be be shown the door one day. And of course, um, companies and organizations lose a lot when all that human capital walks out the door mm -hmm. and suddenly, you know, without transitioning. So what are some things that people could do to, I guess, I'm trying to say, I don't know if I want to say fight ageism or but like recognize when it happens and then do something about it. Um, what's some things that can practical steps, I guess people could do. I love your reframe um, because I don't love, you know, fighting or battling. Um, well, and this is something we can't fight with fists and feet anyway, you know, and so. Right. And it sort of implies that, you know, there's going to be a battle and then somebody will win. And of course, mm -hmm. there, you know, binaries are never, we are never going to get rid of all these forms of bias. Yeah. Um, we are never going to, uh, you know, ha have a world in which everyone is completely equal. But although I think it's really important to work towards that. That's why I do what I do. And mm -hmm. just addressing your earlier point in one more sentence, when we being anti-ageist means joining every struggle for equal rights. And no matter what ism you are preoccupied with, if we make the world less racist, we make it a better place in which to be old. If we make the world a better place to be old, we make it a better place in which to be female or to have a disability, right? All the mm -hmm. activism is intersect too. Um, the most important and hardest starting place is to look at, is to check your own age bias, to look at your own attitudes towards age and aging, because these are new ideas to most of us, because we are all biased. We, it starts in early childhood when attitudes towards race and gender start to form. And we live in a culture that barrages us from Disney movies and children 
books, books on with predominantly negative messages about age and aging. And unless we stop and say, you know, which is what I did at the beginning of this process, like, wait, whoa, 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 what I'm seeing is does not match up to that reality. But unless we do that, those messages become part of our identity. That is internalized bias. So, um, you know, there's a million ways to do it on old school. There's the Harvard implicit bias test. That's oldschool.info. Everything's free except the books or, uh, you know, download the introduction to my book. It's free. Um, but seriously, on old school, there are hundreds of free vetted introductions to ageism from little animations to books, to workshops, to whatever. Educate yourself about age and aging, because I guarantee that the reality is very different, much more nuanced, much more positive than what we have collectively been brainwashed to believe. And it's really uncomfortable. To, I mean, it's my favorite comment on my book, like, oh, crap, I had no idea how ageist I was. But that mm -hmm. tells me that that person has not only made themselves vulnerable, but has taken the first and most necessary step to look at, OK, what's between my ears is part of the problem. I can work to change that. The good news is that the very next step, which is automatic, all you have to do is like all you have to do. It's a big ask mm -hmm. is to look at your own attitudes towards aging, age and aging. The minute you see your own ageism, you see it everywhere around you in billboards, in magazines, on TV shows, in ageist quips on the radio. It's everywhere. And that is really liberating because then you think, you know, this is what consciousness raising did for in the women's movement. Oh, it's not my personal failing. It's not that I have screwed up. I am not a bad person. This stuff is entrenched in the society, in economic policies around me. And that means we can come together and do something about it. So let me ask this. This is going to be kind of a, a, a even a personal question is because can we recognize some of our own, quote, prejudices, wherever they might be, whichever ism they might go to um, in ourselves? And I'm, I'm going to say that because right now I'm actually in the process of hiring another advisor to, to join our team. And I've got a pool of great candidates, but they kind of span the gamut of I've got a couple really young guys. I've got another one. Uh, he seems to be he's about my age. I'm guessing. I don't know. I I, I don't ask the question obviously because you can't. I know I'm terrible uh, at guessing people's ages. Yeah, you know, yeah I, I imagine these <laughs> you know, other, other guys about my age. Yeah, and then another guy. He he volunteered his age and he said he was going to be fifty. And so I, I feel like I've got you know a, a really good cross section of different people to choose from, and they all bring different things to the table. Yeah. And, and so, but yeah. it's just. Because, you know, the, the young guys, you might have the ageism of like, oh, well, what if they're too young, right? What, what if some of the yep. you know, clients might think they're too young? Um, but then you got the older ones where the, the normal thing to think of there is like, well, yeah, but how much longer are they going to be in the workforce, yada, yada. So there's both sides of that. How can we recognize that in ourselves and try to make decisions without those preconceived ideas? Yeah, well, I mean, hats off to you for... Uh, you know, the most important thing you can do is exactly what you are doing, thinking like I, I have my biases and so do my so, so does my client base. Mm -hmm. Right. We, we we it is easiest to work with someone who looks like us. We are not going to achieve a diverse, um, you know, an equitable world unless we can seek to overcome that as mm -hmm. you are doing. It reminds me of a famous experiment that an orchestra, I believe it was a European orchestra. Um, conducted because they realized, shocker, that most of their musicians were older white men. Mm -hmm. And they wanted it to reflect the diversity of their audiences and to give more people a chance. So they conducted auditions behind a curtain. Mm -hmm. And I think they even amended it by putting a carpet so that you couldn't tell how much someone weighed or what kind mm -hmm. of shoes they were wearing. And what happened was that the, the, it, it worked. It, mm -hmm. they, a lot more women got hired, a lot more fat people of non-white people, you know, because you're the, 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 even though the uh, people hiring had the best of intentions that these unconscious beliefs are really fierce. So um, maybe hang a little curtain in front of your zoom window, just kidding. <laughs> um, but just be aware of your biases is the most important thing to do. I mean, there's a maddening study um, recently of HR people 
because a lot of ageism in in hiring takes place right in the hiring process. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, hear these heartrending stories from older people who send out hundreds of resumes and don't get a call back. And if they do, it's over the minute they walk in the room or turn on their camera. So, um, you know, I would just urge urge people. And, and if you, of course, have a, um, you know, a team where not everyone is, a, is a, you know, white guys around the same age, you're going to sell a lot of stuff to white guys around your age, but you're going to miss out on, I mean, I, I just learned this embarrassingly and painfully. We're going to do some fundraising, uh, big scale fundraising for old school. And I did get a funder by writing this letter. And I was like, what's wrong with this one? And our consultant said, do you want to reach more diverse people? This is how you're going to get money from a rich white lady. But if you want to get money and talk to people who are actually funding more diverse groups, and I just, I had not seen the way I was centering, my, you know, whiteness and people like me in the way mm -hmm. I was approaching this project. Habits are hard to break. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say this too. So um, I, I think a key takeaway that I've gotten so far, I mean, you mentioned it in the workplace a few times now. So ageism can affect you financially. Uh, it can even affect you as far as some of the retirement decisions you make, because, you know, if somebody's 65, they're like, oh, are you retiring? Um, and I've always said from uh, for a very long time, retirement's not an age. Retirement could just be an income. It, it all depends on how much you've got saved, what your expenses are. And I mean, there's a lot more that goes into that. But Absolutely. if those things meet, it doesn't have to be an age. I mean, your age is relevant in that it does matter when you entered the workforce. But that's mm -hmm. that is a function of when you were born, mm -hmm. not how old you are. Right. I was lucky. I was born in 1952 and had the incredible demographic good fortune of entering the workforce at an unheralded time of peace and prosperity for middle class white Americans. You know, my dad worked for the same company his whole life. That kind of stability is not available to younger people. So, you know, it, who who switch jobs more often. Um, for which they are vilified. You know, I'm sure you've heard about, you know, disloyal millennials. Um, mm -hmm. Don't get me started on generational labeling. Two points. Uh -huh. At that age, we switch jobs all the time too, because, we're, you know, in our 20s, when because we were trying to figure out what, what to do and what we were yeah. good at. Well, also, I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> right. And these people entered the workforce during a time of recession. Pensions have gone out the window. It is a time of much greater instability. So it's necessary to change jobs to get the raises that increase their chances of saving enough for retirement, which is infinitely harder to do for people who are younger than for older people, not because they're old or young, but because of the state of the economy and society at the point at which they enter the workforce. Does that distinction make sense? Yes, it does. Right. It's not about the strengths or weaknesses. A really big pitfall is to blame. I mean, younger people have every reason to envy me, my demographic good fortune, but it doesn't make me the enemy. And the same forces that take advantage of older people in the workforce and lay us off just because we have bigger salaries because we've been working longer and then hire a bunch of cheap younger people and use that to depress overall wages Ages in the workforce disadvantages people at both ends of the age spectrum. The mm -hmm. issue, the, the underlying issues are, you know, uh, is your employer, you know, taking advantage of you, you know, and how are they pitting workers against each other, whether it's black and brown workers, think about the history of labor here, you know, the latest group of immigrant workers against the, the people who arrived, you know, 20 years earlier to exploit everyone and keep wages down, right? So it, it's not, but what's good for older workers is good for younger workers too. Mm -hmm. So you've done some research on how ageism can actually affect our brain and our body. Uh, would you mind going into that for a little bit? Oh, not at all. Um, it's one of my favorite topics um, is, is the growing body of research that shows how attitudes towards aging affect how our minds and bodies function at the cellular level. I mean, it's not news that there is a mind body connection, mm -hmm. but, um, and what, what happens when you educate yourself about age and aging is that you start to feel better about it. And to, because the prevailing reality is so grim, I, um, I hope uh, you won't mind me mind that I'm shilling. I just happen to have it right here, but a copy of a brand new book 
It's called Breaking the Age Code by Becca Levy, who is a mm -hmm. Yale researcher. I summarize a lot of her research in my book, mm -hmm. but um, uh, but it, the subtitle is How Your Beliefs About Age Determine How Long and How Well You Live. And she casts it as more positive age beliefs. I don't love that phrasing because it makes me sound like you need to ignore the scary stuff and just have a happy attitude, which is not the case. But if you simply educate yourself, if you have a fact rather than fear-based attitudes towards aging, you, you know, statistically, people live an average of seven and a half years longer. They walk faster. They heal quicker. My favorite of her studies shows that they are less likely to develop Alzheimer's, even if they have the gene that predisposes them to the disease. And the theory goes that these positive age beliefs um, buffer you against the stress of living in an ageist world. It says, you know, you're useless, you're ugly, you should shuffle off stage instead of looking at the reality of what, who you are, what you have to contribute and where you are in your life. Well, that is great news for me because I feel like I've actually been, I want to say maybe resisting a little bit of, of ageism uh, since I was even really young. And I, I mentioned earlier, like one of the reasons I work out is basically just to look good. Well, when I hit 30, I had a bunch of people that said, oh, well, now that you're 30, you're just going to start seeing things happen, right? This is going to go and that's going to go or whatever. And I remember thinking every, like when that happened, I'm like, that might be true for you, but that's not going to be true for me. And I feel like I look better even, you know, physically now than I did when I was 30. And then when I hit 40, even more people were like, oh, yeah, now. And so I, I maybe there's part of me that just loves resisting stereotypes. And whether it's ageism or you name, you name it, I'm just like, no, I, I want people to understand. It's like, no, this is what over 40 can look like. This is what, you know, when well, I hit 50, I'm looking forward to it. Great. That's fantastic. And that belief in it will protect you against a lot of, you know, you'll get these horrible birthday cards about being over the hill and you're going to think of that and, and go, you know, ick, that doesn't apply to me. And I hope okay. perhaps you will say gently to the person who gave you that card, you know, what, what, what did you mean by this card? Right. Gently ask them to question, mm -hmm. would they have sent a card that was so derogatory about your skin color, about who you sleep with? How come, how come mocking my age is okay, right? We need to in, instigate those, those conversations. Uh, you know, there are only two inevitable bad things about getting older. Cognitive decline is not inevitable. Mm -hmm. We're gonna lose people we've known all our life and some part of our bodies are gonna fall apart. Your body does not work as well at even at 40 as it did at 30 in some ways. So I'm totally agreeing with what you said, but I wanna put an asterisk up there, which is that it's important not to fall into the trap of age denial, that if I, there's this whole arena of successful aging, air quotes around that, which I don't like because why, why should aging be something to succeed or fail at? If you wake up in the morning, you're succeeding, good on you. And it, um, it sets up this impossible goal, right? That if you work out more harder and harder or eat less and less of this or more and more of that or spend more time at the gym, um, you can continue to age successfully, which really means looking and moving like a younger version of yourself. And it's fantastic that you're working out. But the goal needs to be to stay healthy or look good, not to stay young and to acknowledge that, you know, you are not going to be able to bench press at insert age X as much as you did when you insert smaller number because your body does, you know, these changes are inevitable to some degree, extremely variable. There are other people your age who are built like Arnold Schwarzenegger, which I have to say, I'm delighted you're not, not that you asked me. And there are other people your age who are couch potatoes. It's not about age. It's about fitness. It's about priorities. It's also a lot about class. And that goes undiscussed. These so-called remedies to fix or stop aging cost money, cost time, cost leisure, gym membership, sushi, um, a lot of things that a lot of people don't have access to, which is another reason to resist the narrative that you're only aging right or successfully, mm -hmm. air quotes, um, if you are spending a lot of effort and money trying to um, prevent 
the sum changes, some of which to some degree different in each of us are inevitable because we age well by acknowledging and adapting that to those changes rather than pretending they're never going to happen to us. Excellent. So then how about all these different retirement communities that are becoming popular? Can that, is that just a form of ageism in and of itself? Or is that something that uh, is, is, can be good for people? Um, I, and as I say that, I'm, I'm going back to what you said, even at the very beginning, you know, you can't tell one person what they should do. You don't want to should all over people. Right. You know? yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, there has been a lot of press about um, Margaritaville, this retirement community, also the villages in, I think they're both in Florida, um, really, really fast growing retirement communities for people 55 and up who, judging from the media coverage, which we always need to be, you know, go, go see for ourselves. don't believe everything you see and read, but you would think that these are all middle-class white people who do nothing but drive around in their, um, you know, golf carts and mm -hmm. drink margaritas and party. No judgment. You know, if that's, if you can afford to do that and that's your idea of a good time, far be it for me to say you shouldn't do that or it's bad. Mm -hmm. The retire retirement communities were not invented until the mid 20th century. I think the one in Arizona Sunset Village or something was the first one. And I, what I dislike about them in the abstract is that they are, duh, a segregating factor. And segregation is never good. Communities where people of all ages live together have very little ageism because you're friends with people of all ages and you see the way different ages contribute or fail to contribute, right? You're, you know, you're living just the way if you live in a, an ethnically diverse community, it's much harder to have stereotypes about, you know, Hispanic people or Muslim people or whatever it happens to be because you're living with them and working with them and you like some of them and you don't like others, but not because of, of whether they go to a mosque or a church, yep. right? If you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So, you know, if you, so I don't love the idea of these communities because I think, um, I think being involved with people of all ages enriches our life. Age segregation in the U.S. cuts us off from most of humanity. I don't want to live somewhere where everyone is the same race as me and the same, um, you know, has the same habits as me. I want to be challenged and I want to sort of have different stuff coming at me as a catalyst to, you know, I'm not going to like be able to keep up with any, everything, but I personally don't like the idea of listening to Jimmy Buffett all day long and not um, being challenged by people who are different. Mm -hmm. So uh, socially speaking, I don't love the idea, but I also think if that's what you wanna do, you know, you are, you, these communities provide the most important component of a good old age, not health, which I would have thought it was. And then I thought, well, it must be money, not wealth. Having a strong social network is the most important component of a good old age. So those people are, are heading into old age way better off in that sense than someone living in a house in suburbia without ties to their neighbors. Perhaps they won't be able to drive after a while. But Margaritaville is a much better prescription for a good old age than being isolated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And to your comment of keeping things different so that you can remain challenged or not, you know, continue down just like one thought process. I always tell people that's the reason that I read both Fox News and the New York Times. So I can always read both sides so that I don't end up like so far one way or so far the other way. So I can see things, I can yeah. see different perspectives and understand that both of them can have merit. And then I can make up my own mind on what I think is actually, you know, more correct or is more correct for me yeah. rather than some. I mean, that's more work, Yeah, you know, and some people d just don't want to make that effort or don't feel it's worth it. And of course that's their choice. And mm -hmm. if you can afford that retirement, I'm not going to say, you know, don't do it. It's a, not, even if I had the, the power to tell or the desire to tell people what to do. Yeah. In my line, that's uh, of work. That's what I have to do. A lot of times when I ask people what they really want to do in retirement, if it's not what I want to do, it doesn't matter. It's like, that's not my job is to judge what they want to do. If it's different than mine, mine is just to help them figure out a way to make sure they can do it. That's yep. it. And, and so, and plus by hearing different ideas, I've gotten some ideas where I've like, Oh, I never thought of doing that. That sounds great. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I should look into that. Yeah. 
So we're, we're trying to, we're starting to come up on our time here. So if you don't uh, mind, I'm going to kind of move to some other rapid fire questions here. Um, one of them being first off, what would your definition of retirement be? I know we talked a little bit about retirement a little while ago, but, and kind of maybe how I would describe even my own, but what would your definition of retirement be? Well, I, I mean, I've been self-employed for so long that the whole idea is very fuzzy to me. Mm -hmm. I am lucky enough to love what I do and to be able to choose how hard I want to work. I'm pretty driven and, you know, I wake up in the morning and my inbox is full and there are days when I think, geez, do I want to be working this hard? Mm -hmm. um, but I do not aspire I mean, I've always loved to work and been very work obsessed. So it's a source of enormous pleasure and identity for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, it's very hard for me to imagine a world in which I am not working. But then again, I'm not terribly comfortable saying that because I think especially in a hyper capitalist society, we have a lot of judgment around people who do not go somewhere, even somewhere virtual can be fine, you know, and make money. And it is really problematic to tie people's worth to their conventional economic productivity. Older people are productive, who are retired, who are not in the paid workforce anymore, contribute enormously. We spend money. Most looking after older people is done by other older people at no cost to the economy. That has is value in the billions of dollars. You know, if I even just to keep it in terms of the workforce, if I am watching my grandchild you know, X mornings a week so that the kids' parents can go off to work. I am helping them earn. So I don't ever want to link the value of a human being to whether or not they, they work in conventional terms and how much money they make. That's, and if you, if you want to, I really dislike the, you know, there's a lot of talk in aging, like idle hands and keeping busy. If you want your hands to be idle and to sit on the porch swing and read romance novels and you can afford to do it more power to you. There is no right way to do this. It's hard for me to imagine not keeping my hand in by writing the occasional thing or, or talking to people if people are still interested in hearing what I have to say. Um, but it's very fuzzy and I don't, you know, I don't know what, what it will look like. I would like to work less hard, I imagine. Um, but I don't really know what that'll look like, you know, and I think, and in a sense, I think that protects me it, from having a fixed point of view, because who knows, you know, these are strange times. The whole future of work is changing. AI is going to change everything. I hope we'll diminish ageism in the workforce, which will give me and, and all the other people, you know, my age or older, uh, more opportunities than we have now. So there's an awful lot of balls up in the air. Mm -hmm. And this next question, I think just based on the conversation we've already had, I, I may already know the answer to it, but I still want to want to ask it and hear it in your uh, words. What is something that, say, 20 years down the road that you would like to look back on and think was absolutely absurd? Or 20 years from now, you look back and say, man, I can't believe we used to X, whatever that was. Well, uh, I would hope that we will have made enough progress around age bias as we have around gender bias and um, bias on the grounds of sexual orientation and on um, you know your your what what race or ethnic group you belong to so that assumptions on the basis of age um, will no longer go unquestioned I would like to see that entire greeting card birthday card aisle in your corner drugstore eliminated uh you know everyone that has some disgusting thing i mean those those cards are horrendous i mean they are like they are like hate hate mail hate speech hate cards um <laughs> because they they are so full of self-loathing and denigration and i hope walk into the store and if there are any of those will walk up to the proprietor store and say how could you sell this how could you be encouraging people to loathe the, who they are and to live in fear of their of of who they will become, and to participate in a prejudice against their own future selves. So I've got a lot of uh, clients that work at Hallmark, so I'm going to see if they can pull any strings and get those <laughs> some of those greeting birthday cards messages. Fantastic! Or just when you go in the drugstore, turn them around. 
Yeah. That's that's an anti-ageist act. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what would be the best uh, best way to reach you? Any like the book resources? Uh, obviously, we're going to be linking to the book. But is there any other ways that if people wanted to reach out and connect with you? What would be the best? Yes, way? I, I am very easy to find. Um, my uh, website is thischairrocks.com. If you don't want to read the book, um, I've been thinking out loud in blog form. I'm just see it right there on the, on the list, you know, this chairrocks.com slash blog. So you can search if you want to learn more about um, Levy's research, for example, enter Levy in the search term or healthcare or, you know, identity, anything you want. I also have a blog, which you can also get to through the, my main blog called Yo, Is This Ageist? where you can send in a question or an image or whatever about whether something you've encountered or seen or perhaps said or done is ageist. Uh, and I work hard to come up with, you know, thoughtful advice about that. Hopefully also funny, sometimes funny. Um, and I'm pretty active on social media. Um, I have a This Chair Rocks book page. Um, I'm my, my name and LinkedIn and I'm at This Chair Rocks on Twitter, which I love. And um, and also on Instagram. So it's easy to find me. Yeah. And please also check out the old anti-ageism clearinghouse, old school dot info. Got it. We'll have links to all of that. And to your question of yo, is this ageist? Uh, that that question sparked another uh, question is, is it considered ageist if there is a certain thing that you uh, that you're thinking about either someone that's young or something that's old that's actually good is that still is that still ageist a great question that's a great question nate yep it, stereotypes can be benevolent you know the wise the wise elder for example or mm -hmm. or you know the innocent young person or the energetic young person those are still stereotypes mm -hmm. and you know one of my you know a classic one is that old people are wise people are wise some old people don't seem to have learned a thing along the way <laughs> and a right you know and some i mean have you ever met the wise child and gotten the shiver like oh wow this like eight year old knows how that i'm ever going to learn mm -hmm. so i think it's really even a benevolent there's a lot of thought a lot of um at a behavior towards older people, older women in particular, is benevolent. Like, we know what's good for you, dear, and we're here to help you. No one wants pity. People want to be respected. So any judgment on the basis of age, whether it's positive or negative, is still ageist because we need to look beneath the age to think about what the actual attribute is and whether that person has it or doesn't have it, which probably doesn't have much to do with how old they are. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, and what would you say that is some of the best advice you've ever received? Um, I guess I, I think of a saying of my grandmother's who is long dead, but she, and I don't think she came up with it, but she used to say comparisons are odious. And any comparison between you and your sister between mm -hmm. older people and younger people, it's just never helpful to measure ourselves in that way. You know, I mean, uh, on Instagram being a toxic, toxic example of all these, especially young women who have already getting, you know, cosmetic surgery and fillers and then they use filters. And then everyone who doesn't look like that thinks, oh my God, ugly, I'm fat, I'm a failure. So that's a sort of extreme and crowdsourced example of toxically comparing ourselves to other people. We need, and we know this from the body acceptance movement, we know this from Buddhism, we know this from literature, we know this from life itself, that you know, contentment uh, lies in making peace with who you are, trying to be the best version of yourself that you be, but accepting who you are and not holding yourself up to um, others, or, and also and not holding yourself ideally above other people either. A lot of that sort of uh, snobbery in a way or judgment around people, old people who use social media, for example, are like, I can't believe he doesn't know how to text. Well, maybe he can't read the font. You know, maybe mm -hmm. he can't afford a smartphone. Suspend judgment. So I think your grandmother was uh, wise before the the saying ever came out because I've heard so, uh, something similar about comparison. I've heard it called "comparison is the thief of joy." Nice. And I think yeah. that's right along those lines. Very nice. Yeah, same idea. Yeah. Well, great. Well, then, um, 
Anything else that you would like to, I guess, any parting words of wisdom or guidance that you would like to leave my listeners before we go? Um, you know, I just, I, I hope that you are inspired. I and mean, we, we, I, I call it age cooties. We think that anything to do with aging is going to be icky. I did 15 <laughs> years ago. And, you know, aging is not something annoying and icky that old people do. It is something we embark on the day we are born. So I, er and it's fascinating because it's how we move through life, you know, for a generalist like me. So I urge you to try and get over your age cooties and educate yourself a little bit about age and aging. Read the introduction to my book, Noodle Around on Old School. There's tons of stuff out there in all, you know, little short movies, animations, all kinds of different formats. because even though the first bit is like, ooh, I never thought to question these things, right around that corner is a, is a whole change of attitude that is so much more healthy and good for us than this sort of hamster wheel of denial and dread, which is the mode that most of us live in, and it's not good for us. Mm -hmm. And, and so then again, um, anybody listening to this that does want a copy of Ashton's book, This Chair Rocks, A Manifesto Against Ageism, then all you need to do is leave an honest review of the podcast on wherever you find your podcasts, and then copy and paste that into an email, send that to asknate at retirementrescueradio.com, and we'll be able to send those out until they're gone. So that is it's it. fun to read. I promise. <laughs> All right. Well, again, Ashton, thank you for coming on. Thank you for, uh, you know, trying to, I, I keep wanting to use the word fight ageism. I mean, that, but that's just how you know, my, a black belt in martial arts, that's confront. just how confront. confront. Okay. Let's use that confront challenge, challenge, challenge. I like that one. Challenge, challenge yeah. is much better. That is a more apt uh, word, challenging ageism and, and helping people really realize that no matter what the age someone is, they can have any of the attributes that you talk about, whether they're good or bad, it doesn't matter. Uh, and so, yes, appreciate you coming on and bringing more awareness to this. Thank you so much. All right. So um, thank you for listening to this and go ahead and, and reach out to oldschool.info. We'll have all the links to everything in the show notes. And uh, that's it, guys. Thanks for joining us. And we'll see you again here next week. Take care. <laughs>